Do you wonder if others are dealing with the same project management challenges as you? Not sure where to turn for guidance and leadership? Office Hours are in session as we discuss project management and PMOs with global leaders, hearing their story and learning their secrets to success. Our goal is to empower you and help you elevate your PMO and project management career to new heights. Welcome back to Project Management Office Hours with your host, PMO Joe. Welcome, everyone, to Project Management Office Hours. We're the number one live project management radio show in the U.S., and we're broadcasting to you today from the Phoenix Business Radio X studios in Tempe, Arizona. I'm your host, PMO Joe, and for the next hour or so, we'll be talking project management. Before we jump into the show with our special guest, I wanted to share with everyone some exciting news. The PMO Leader, if you're a regular listener of the show, you know that that global community website is now live. And we did a soft launch back in January. We're hosting our Go Live launch party on April 2nd. So we have a full day worth of announcements and giveaways, benefits for our members. We're having a live Q&A panel with Peter Taylor, Marissa Silva, Fatima Abuchi, and myself. And you can go out and register for that event now at the PMO Leader website, which is uh, simple enough, thepmoleader.com. While you're out there, be sure to visit the site to see all the different training that's available, uh, the books, the blogs, the coaches, the speakers, the PPM technology providers. So a whole host of information out there. And the part that I enjoy the most on the site is actually the forum, uh, which is a group of discussion boards, which allows us to interact with our peers from around the world. We, you know, ask your questions, what books you're reading, what trends are in the industry. Uh, so that's a fun spot. There's free and paid membership options out there. So we're not about any specific methodology or framework. There's plenty of organizations out there that do a great job with what they do. What we do is bring all of them and let the consumer make a decision on what's the best fit for them. So uh, check it out, pmoleader.com. And we look forward to talking to all of you on April 2nd. Also want to take a moment to thank our sponsors, the PMO Squad and the PMO Leader. The PMO Squad is the premier PMO consulting firm in the U.S., and you can learn more about them at thepmosquad.com. Also a reminder that all of these shows are recorded, so please visit our website, projectmanagementofficehours.com. You can see a list of all of our upcoming episodes, as well as everybody else that we have planned for this coming year. So excited to have with us today our guest, Frank Salatis, who is joining us from Florida today. Thank you, Frank, for taking time to uh, share your story with our audience. It was nice to be here. Thank you for inviting me. Yes, uh, if you can, uh, just take a a moment to introduce yourself and Mm -hmm. Let uh, everybody know a little bit about your background and uh, your story. Okay, well, I'll just do that really quick. Um, I, I got involved in project management when I was working at AT and T. Worked at AT and T for for twenty eight and a half years. I also spent about three years working for uh, Cisco Systems. But I got engaged in in project management through a manager, what my boss' name was, Dan Ono, and uh, he actually promoted the the PMP credential back then and uh, brought me into the project management organization at at and But a requirement to be part of that organization was to, you had to successfully achieve your PMP credential. And when you were brought into the organization, you had, uh, I think, 18 months in which to, uh, to get your certification. So I went through all the training and I went through a lot of uh, project management program courses that were available through, uh, through at and and uh, got my, my certification in 1992, and I'm, I'm number 535 in terms of uh, the number of, uh, of the uh, people that have uh, got their PMP. So 535 tells you a little bit about the fact that yeah. I've been around for a while. So uh, I got involved in project management, found it to be a um, kind of a natural thing for me. I really, really enjoyed it. Uh, from from there, I actually, in, in 1991, uh, became the president of the New York City PMI chapter. 
And I was president of that chapter uh, actually three times. I was president of PMI's Assembly of Chapter Presidents from 1999 to 2001. I've actually spent a lot of time uh, doing a lot of training in project management. Um, I've spoken at the PMI uh, congresses and symposiums. The first one I did was in 1993, and I've, I've actually spoken at almost all of them up until about 2015. Uh, I'm a trainer instructor for PMI's Seminars World. Uh, I've, I've written 12 books or published 12 books on project management, and I keep busy with a, um, a, a series of articles for Project Management World, the Project Management Journal, I should say, Project Management World Journal. And I, I feature a monthly contribution called Positive Leadership in Project Management. Right now, I'm currently the uh, president, again, of the PMI New York City chapter. And uh, I'm still involved in doing a lot of things in the, in the world of project management, trying to make contributions. So that's, that's my story. A long and distinguished career, to say the least. And yes, triple digits for PMP uh, certification number is uh, impressive. We had Lee Lambert on last year. I don't think his number is that low because I know he said he was excluded from taking the test for, I think it was a decade or so. So I know you've got Lee built. Oh, yeah. I, I know Lee for a long time. And I, I do have him beat in terms of the, the, the uh, certification number. <laughs> yeah. Also, you didn't mention, but just for those uh, to know, all of that work has been recognized. 2006, you were named PMI Person of the Year. In 2013, you became a PMI Fellow. And in 2015, you received the PMI Distinguished Contribution Award. All of that is to uh, tip our hat to you and those that are making a difference in our industry, really to not just be present, but to be contributing and, and be a leader. So thank you for all that you've done, Frank. I really appreciate that uh, on behalf of our industry. Well, I've enjoyed it. It's been fun and it's been a learning experience too. The other thing that uh, has me intrigued about you is I've been able to participate in International Project Management Day. Um, IIL uh, now has popularized that to a certain extent of they have a big giant conference every year that they they have people at and i was fortunate enough to speak at that a couple of years ago but you're the the father of ipm day is that correct what's that tell us that story how does that all come about well that's that's an interesting story uh, yeah i guess i could call myself the uh, the father of it the founder of international project management day the uh, the story goes back to P pmi and they still do this today, but they have a, uh, a program called the uh, Leadership Institute Master's Class. And uh, I was enrolled in that in 2004. I'm in the class of 2004. It's an 18-month uh, leadership uh, development program. And uh, at the time, I think there were 25 uh, students uh, in that particular group. And it was uh, an exercise in, in leadership and and, and basically developing better relationships with people, communications, and things like that was really kind of an interesting session. But at the, uh, at the end of the program, our, our final day of class, the, uh, the uh, uh, instructor, trainer, professor, uh, Jerry Brightman said, as it kind of gave us a charge, he said, go out and change the world. Okay? And of course, this, this program was relatively new back then. I think I was in the second class. But he said, go out and change the world. And, and I kind of took that to heart and, and thought, you know, what, what could we do to change the world? You know, what could I do? I gave it a lot of thought. And I said, you know, here we are, 2004. Project management has been around for a long time. Project managers doing all this work and not really getting an appreciation for the work that they do. Project managers, is, to me, it's, I've always referred to it as the unappreciated profession. My premise to that was that if, if you really think about it, and anything that anybody does or uses, I should say, in any particular day, whether they're driving their car, using a laptop, a computer, their smartphone, making a trip by plane, boat, train, bus, or, or whatever, you know, the house they, they live in, the building that they work in, wherever that is, the networks that they use. Everything is the result of a project. Just about everything that people use every day is the result of a project and a project team. I said, I don't think anybody really thinks about that. I mean, nobody walks into a building 
and looks at the building and goes, wow, what a project this was. Well, that must have been difficult. I mean, all these different things that had to be done. It's all taken for granted. So I, I kind of took that to heart. And then I said, you know, we need to recognize project managers. And I said, you know, we have uh, we have Mother's Day. We have Father's Day. We have uh, Grandparents Day. We have uh, Executive Assistance Day. We even have in the U.S. we have National Beer Day. You know, we we have a uh, well, that's an uh, ice cream that's an sandwich day. day. We, we, we can't <laughs> that diminish. Beer day, by the way, gets a lot of attention. <laughs> yeah, you know? we can't diminish Beer Day. I mean, yeah, <laughs> that's right. So I said, okay, uh, let's let's do this. Let's let's have an International Project Management Day. And I, I went and I started to look on, uh, you know, to, to determine, you know, what day could this be on, right? And in in the world, the international, if you look at the global world, uh, every single day there is some holiday or some event that that somebody somewhere, some country is recognizing. So I, I found that the first Thursday in November was the day that had the least number of other holidays or festivals or anything like that. So I proclaimed uh, International Project Management Day to be the first Thursday of November every year. And uh, it, uh, IIL, the International Institute uh, for Learning, uh, uh, their, their CEO, Laverne Johnson, said, hey, this is a great idea. And they, they promoted the very first International Project Management Day as a webinar. And it has grown into a, um, a very, very big production that promotes project management and, and project teams and, and so on. Uh, and I know that they get in the area of uh, twenty to 30,000 people that attend those programs. So I know that you were a speaker on it, but, but the, they have helped promote the concept of International Project Management Day and uh, many, many other uh, PMI chapters and uh, businesses have actually put that into their yearly program and have a special event on International Project Management Day. So it's really about a day of, of recognition. It's not a day of celebration. You know, we're not celebrating completion of projects. What we're celebrating, what we're recognizing and acknowledging is that project managers do amazing things and produce amazing results that impact Everybody in the world, from the from children to, to adults, and uh, just about everything that we use is somehow associated with a project. And I think I thought that um, project managers deserve a little recognition, and that's what it is. So it's a day of recognition, not a celebration, but it's a more like organizations take the time and say thank you to your project managers for the work that they do and their project teams, and, and that's really what it's all about. Yeah, I, I think it's obviously <clears throat> fantastic for our industry and such a a bonus to be able to have it be global, right? It's not just a U.S.-based event. It's international, as it's called. So I'll, I, take me back to the beginning because you, you finish up this class, you, you identify this day, and you say it's going to be international project management. How does the rest of the world get to find out about that, right? I mean, it's, you know, Frank Salatis has declared this shall be the day. And then, and then what <laughs> you know, happened? And then the crickets, right? I mean, what comes next? <laughs> well, actually, that that worked out really well because, you know, um, after I, I mentioned it, what I did was before we actually started it, before I got it going, I went to the uh, my my colleagues that were graduating with me from the uh, the leadership master's class, and I said, you know, what what do you think of this idea? And, and then I got uh, you know a tremendous amount of support saying I'll I'll make sure that we get the word out. So. Um, um, and the Inter International Institute for Learning also uh, uh, put it into their marketing plan. We're going to do this. We're going to get the word out. Uh, I went to several chapters, uh, some businesses and so on, and they all thought this is a great idea. And it kind of just took off from there. So um, and then I, I, I found in a, uh, a P PMI uh, put out this publication monthly called PMI Today, and uh, I found the original uh, article. I saved a lot of stuff from from PMI, but the original article about introducing International Project Management Day, and they recognized it back then in their publication, uh, and then that kind of spread out to all of the chapters, and then beyond the chapters to companies, and uh, it, it's been just kind of growing and growing every year since, and it's a recognized day. 
Yeah, I think it's uh, it's great that it also shows the power of what one individual can do with a great idea and bring it to an industry and have the industry share on it. So certainly it, it's been an impetus as well. At the beginning of the show, I talked about the PMO Leader site. The way that site came about was during this year of COVID, we've had a lot of conferences and webinars where people get together for a day or an event, and then there's nothing that keeps them together afterwards. Um, and a lot of them are the speakers, the presenters have content, right, that they want to be able to distribute and get out to people. And there is no site in our industry that allows uh, transactional e-commerce between producers and consumers of content on a global platform, regardless of your particular methodology or framework. And I remembered back to when I spoke at IIL and said, hey, there's an international project management day, the, recognizing the day. What about the rest of the year? Let's create a site that allows all of the uh, community members to be either consumers or producers of content and bring it to a destination where it's a global marketplace and, and we can all interact, whether you're a believe in PMI or Prince2 or P3O or PMO Global Alliance and whatever it may be, guess what? All of them are, are good, you know, but they don't fit for everybody all the time. So let's bring them all together and see what happens. So uh, International Project Management Day was one of the driving thoughts behind building out that community to show that we can come together as a global community and, and celebrate or recognize ourselves on a given day. Let's do it all year round. Well, I, that's that, that was my other message. Uh, you know, the, the day was just like, uh, you know, this Father's Day and Mother's Day and so on, like I said. And those are special days, a day of, uh, you know, very, very specific targeted recognition. But uh, the, the other message, as you just pointed out, was these people are doing this work every day. And, and again, uh, I don't see the kind of appreciation uh, amongst uh, many, many, you know, we'll call executive managers and many corporations uh, that they, they don't seem to understand, you know, the, uh, the challenges that a project manager faces every day. Uh, it's just simply, you know, get it, go get it done. And, and they don't really appreciate the fact that I have to talk to multiple people. I'm dealing with multiple personalities, multiple contractors and service providers. I'm dealing with attitudes and difficult stakeholders. Uh, I have to watch the budget. Uh, I have risks out there that I'm constantly watching. I have to watch the, plan the changes in plans because stakeholders and customers can be very fickle, and, and I still have to get all this stuff done and maintain my sanity. And, and I don't think that that's ever been really, truly appreciated by anybody that is not a project manager. And, and you can imagine, you know, there, there are different levels of project manager. I mean, there are project managers who manage lots and lots of what we'll call small projects. Maybe they're a week or two or a month or two months in duration, and maybe not too much in terms of complexity. And then you get the more complex projects that can last up to a year or more. And then you get the mega projects that are in the millions and billions of dollars. And, you know, the, the fundamentals of project management still remain the same, although the challenges are going to be different between, uh, you know, uh, someone building a, a residential house as opposed to someone building a 50-story building in New York City. You know, there's different challenges. But the concepts are there and the challenges are there. And, and uh, I, I don't think that, 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 that many people truly appreciate it. I kind of joke around with that a little bit. And I, I put something up on LinkedIn not that, that long ago, and I got a really great response from it. But uh, I, um, in, in some of my speeches and lectures and classes, uh, I would uh, challenge the people, most of them, are, of course, project managers, and I would say, if someone asks you, what do you do for a living? The response, the common response is, I'm a project manager. And the response to the person asking the question is something like, oh, uh, oh okay. <laughs> and kind of find a way to walk away because they don't really understand what that is, but it doesn't sound that exciting. But, you know, if, if, if someone said, what do you do for a living? And somebody said, well, I'm a doctor, or I'm a brain surgeon. Wow, I'm, I'm really impressed. You know, tell me about it. must be exciting or something like that. So my uh, suggestion to project managers 
is if somebody asks you, you know, what do you do for a living? Don't say, I'm a project manager. Say something like, I am leading a team that is developing a product that is going to change the lives of millions of people. I'm sure you people will be compelled to say, what, 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 are, you, what are you working on? And, and that's how you get things going. So we got to stop this. I'm a project manager because people don't understand that. But if you give them something more, I'm leading this team. We're changing this. We're building that. We're going, we have technology that is going to advance us another 10 years. Whatever that is, people are going to be compelled to want to ask you more questions and be excited for you. And I think that that's a fundamental thing that we got to get across to all project managers. The work that you do is extraordinary. It's really different than a lot of other things. And we need to make people understand what that is. Yeah, I, I agree. I, uh, my wife, uh, coming up on 20 years or so, has no idea what I do, right? <laughs> to this day, my parents still don't know what to do. My kids, are, everyone's like, so what do you do? I get your, what does a project manager do? Uh, so I, I absolutely completely understand what you're saying. And, and I'm one of those project management geeks that does look at stuff and think about the project that it took to do that. Uh, as an example, yesterday we we did a day trip up to the Grand Canyon and we're hiking along the South rim of the Grand Canyon. For those who've been there, there's this, you know, 14 mile trail along the, the rim of the Canyon. Imagine the project to build that trail because it's a completely paved trail, right? It's not a, a footpath. And as we're all walking along, and some points there's railings, some points there's not railings, some points there's uh, rocks and information. So some project manager, right, was working with a team to be able to build this trail with a Grand Canyon right next to you, right? So there's safety concerns and health concerns, and it's a national park. So there's federal guidelines that are in place, right? So I'm with you. I, I think that we um, don't take advantage of what we do to be able to properly promote ourselves. So I think one day a year to having that recognition uh, is certainly needed. So thank you for putting that all together for all of us to take advantage of, right? And we should be using that as an impetus to do it on a daily basis and not just once per year. Right. Well, one of the things that I think is, is significant, and, and I know that the space program had been put on hold for a while for budgetary reasons, but the uh, the recent uh, flight to Mars, uh, I mean, if people really think about the project, that project and how uh, intense that was and how many, uh, you know, how many people were involved and, and, and how much work that was and the risks associated in the planning, uh, that that in itself you know, and I'm not, I'm not sure people really fully understand how long it took to get all this together to get the, the vehicle on on, the, on Mars. And, uh, you know, the NASA has actually moved project management forward for, for, for many, many years. And they have all kinds of techniques and stuff that they have put together. So, uh, you know, my, my in, intention with International Project Management Day is it's, it's really kind of like a, um, a, a mission and I'll call it a homework assignment for project managers. You, you, you got to build up what it is that you do. You got to get people to pay attention to um, that, that. Just about anything is a project. The movies that you go and see, that's a project. OK, the, the, the cruise ship that you are on, you know, when we eventually can do cruises again, you know, uh, that was a project. Bridges that you go over, you take it just take for granted. That's the easiest way to get to work. Can you imagine the engineering that went into it to that to do that particular bridge or tunnel? Uh, the entertainment industry, a conference, okay? Somebody organizing a big conference, and when when it, the hotels open up, well, hopefully we'll see that again. Uh, even uh, uh, you know, uh, virtual conferences. These are all projects, and I'm sure that the majority of people are not even thinking about them as projects. And I think that that's what we have to do is get the message out. Yeah. And, and earlier <clears throat> you had mentioned positive leadership and project management. And this is what, to a certain extent, this is what you're talking about, right? It's, it's exactly. share, sharing about that. So t tell us a little bit more about why it's important to present a positive message uh, and positive leadership and project management, how important and powerful that can be. Well, you know, um, I, I actually, uh, that was, I, I wrote that book. It was published in 2013. It was called Positive Leadership and Project Management. 
And uh, it was basically a kind of an outcome of multiple articles that I had written for a website called allpm.com, which goes back to like 1999, 2000, 2001. So I wrote about, I don't know, 150 articles that were published uh, for All PM uh, way, way back then. And uh, then I looked at the the best of the articles that I thought and used them to put together the uh, the book, Positive Leadership and Project Management. And I had gotten the idea, just walking through a bookstore once, and I and I did see a, a book that was entitled Positive Leadership, just that just that. And I said, hmm, well, well, why not about Positive Leadership and Project Management? So I, I took that idea, and I was looking at. Project managers in general, and, and, and PMI, the Project Management Institute, has always professed that a project manager was, was placed in a leadership position, okay? Uh, you're leading a team. You have uh, something to produce. You have responsibilities. You have to motivate the team, all the, the leadership things. But um, I don't know that a lot of project managers really understood that. Uh, you know, a project manager is a methodology. It's a means to an end. And uh, I, I think that um, a, a lot of project managers, at least you know, from my experience, did not have what we're going to call the the softer skills that were needed. Okay, many many project managers were put into project management positions because of their technical expertise, as opposed to their people expertise. Mm-hmm. And I, when I was working at Cisco. Uh, we had Cisco Systems. We we ran into some issues where we the project managers were were super techs. They were just unbelievable technicians, and uh, they focused more on the technical aspect and and not necessarily the integration aspect and the people aspect. I worked in professional services, and we came up with a, a different thought, and we said that our project managers did not have to be technically competent. We needed them to be technically credible. In other words, you don't have to be the technical expert. You should be able to understand what's going on and understand how all the piece parts come together and uh, be able to integrate all the parts. But you don't have to build these things, test these things, design or anything like that. That's not your job as a project manager. That's for the super techs and the people that have that uh, expertise. So that became the focus that we needed our uh, (coughs) project managers to be technically credible meaning that they could speak the language, they can understand engineers, they can speak to technicians, they understood how to work with them and so on and pull all the pieces together without physically doing all this work, this technical work. And uh, so I said, okay, if we're technically credible, uh, the other part of that is is really being uh, a strong leader, a good manager, kind of balance the two together, you know, we have management responsibilities, we have schedules to keep, we have reports to do, okay, and we have to track budget, you know, we have management stuff, but then we also have leadership stuff, you know, keep your team focused, make them feel good about the work they do, motivate them, uh, treat them well, acknowledge them when they need to, you know, have feedback sessions with them, that's all leadership. And we need to do that in a more positive way. We, we, we need uh, leaders that have an attitude that, hey, I'm working with you. You know, you're not working for me. I'm supporting you. And, and that, that concept of servant leadership kind of, uh, you know, comes into play here. So when I, I put the book together, the idea of positive leadership was that you, as a leader of a team, need to kind of maintain a, a positive, you know, uh, enjoyable work environment even under difficult times, okay, that you still have to find solutions. You have to show people that you have confidence in yourself and you have to give confidence and, and empower people. And all of that was kind of the basis of, of what I call positive leadership. So I, I kind of expanded on that and I'm still doing that today. I'm, I'm writing uh, articles for the uh, Project Management World Journal and I'm continuing to focus on the importance of Working with people, the, the servant leadership aspect, being a strong leader, uh, being assertive when you need to be, uh, you know, to communicate to, with people effectively, all of those different things. And that's really what the, uh, the uh, whole basis of positive leadership is about. And that certainly resonates with me, uh, with the purpose-driven PMO. 
which is the uh, signature service the PMO squad offers. Uh, gear number three in that is empower people, right? And when you had mentioned that when you were describing it, I said, absolutely. I wish um, a lot of the associations out there that are providing the certifications focus on the technical skills. Very exactly. few of them are focusing on how to be a leader, right? It, you can build the best WBS, but if you can't motivate a team to execute the tasks in the schedule you built from the WBS, did the WBS really matter? You know, it just, you'll end up being late based on that. You'll have a great schedule and then you won't be able to lead the team <coughs> to accomplish it. So I'm, I'm completely with you, Frank. I think this is a, uh, a gap in our industry that we haven't fully uh, developed and filled yet of how to bring those power skills or soft skills into the forefront. And we've had a lot of guests on. Uh, Dr. Barbara Troutline has certainly talked about that with the uh, change intelligence, Carol Osterweil, Ruth Pierce, and, and many others where we've talked about these components <laughs> to try to get the focus not just on how to technically be a project manager, but how to be a project leader, right? A delivery expert, somebody that can help the team deliver. So I, I think it's great. And of course, all of that, the main component of it is change management, right? I mean, if, if we're out there leading projects that are all delivering something new, change management is inherent in everything we do. What's your spin on, on how that uh, spins a horrible word? I shouldn't have said that, right? Because that means it's not real. What's your perspective on the organizational change management component to projects? Well, I actually uh, wrote a, a fairly lengthy article on um, uh, organizational change management, change leadership. It was published uh, with a, a number of other authors uh, through through PMI. Uh, and and I, I'm, I'm I'm trying to remember the exact title of the book, but it was definitely Organizational Change Management. And um, I did a lot of research on it. And having been working for AT&T for 28 and a half years, saw a lot of organizational change there. Uh, I saw organizational change at Cisco and in a lot of places that I did consulting work and training work for. And um, it, it is a challenge. And, and one of the things that I came up with in my research which uh, was really interesting was that according to several studies, and they kind of combined them all, that only uh, 29% of organizational change initiatives were considered successful. And this was a study done back in between like 2017 and 2019. And I thought, wow, that's pretty significant. Only 29% of organizational change initiatives were successful. Why would that be? And um, the, the issue here was that most organizational change was top-down driven uh, without a lot of input from people who were going to be most affected by the change. And uh, therefore, it was very, very hard to sell the change. And what you did was you wound up with a lot of uh, resistance. And uh, the they termed this process that people were using for change, disruptive change. They were calling it disruptive change because the attitude was you had to dare tear something down in order to build something new. And uh, if you kind of uh, imagine, you know, if you, if, you, if you can imagine a chart that would show this, you, the, the, short, the chart would be, let's say that um, an organization is moving along a path that has a kind of a slow growth upward. You know, it's, it's not flat, but it's re relatively slow growing up. And uh, they introduce change. They bring in massive change and they're going to switch people's jobs and do different things. So th then what's going to happen is this, uh, this line that was relatively flat, but just slightly increased, drops down considerably. It goes bang, because now people are in a disruptive stage they're in denial. They're trying. To, they're complaining about what are you doing this for? I don't understand it. And then eventually, uh, management figures out a way to get out of that that dive that took place. And then you see a line going up at a much much steeper slope. So you have this line going across flat, goes drops down, and then back up. And that big drop down is what we try to avoid. Now, the what's going on in today's change management world. Is, is to smooth out that drop, that you don't want to have a move forward, a sudden jagged drop, and then a rise up. 
What you want to have is something that more looks like a curve, an upward curve, where you're eliminating the disruptive side of change. And I found something that was really, really useful. I was reading uh, several different articles and books, uh, the Harvard uh, Business Review, and discovered something that, that actually made a tremendous amount of sense. And I'm not so sure a lot of people are using it. It was called Cotter's Eight-Step Change Process, K-O-T-T-E-R-S. And uh, I looked at that and I said, wow. This makes all the sense in the world. What we're trying to do is, is, is minimize the disruption, get people to buy into it before you make the change, allow them to add their input, make sure that we listen to them because they're the ones that are going to be most affected by it. You know, we call those the, the, uh, the stakeholders, you, you know, the, 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 the really the people that are going to be involved in this, whatever the operation is when it's over, and get their input. Ask them, what, what do you think? What do you think might be a better way to do this? You know, is this functionality going to work for you? I mean, you know, all the things that happen on a day-to-day basis that an executive has no knowledge of. So if you can take the top-down approach of change and connect it to the bottom-up, which is the people that are going to eventually have to live with it, implement it, and live with it, you're going to have a better chance of being successful with organizational change. It makes complete sense, and it makes me think back to uh, Clubhouse, this new social media platform that's out there. I was in a Clubhouse room where somebody asked the question, should I get change management certified as a project manager, whether it's ProSci or, you know, follow ADCAR or, or some other formal definition or certification program? Because we don't train people in change management, right? Again, we're, cha- we're training them on the technical skills of running the project. Uh, and the challenge that a lot of people came up with, the pushback was, when do we have time to get the training we need to become change experts when we're in the middle of the change itself? Uh, so this is a, a, a challenge, right? Within our industry, I think is, again, everything we're doing is unique. It's a project, it's new. We're confronted with change on a continuous basis. Our certifying bodies aren't certifying us to help us understand the change process. There isn't as much exposure to it, right? You had to go find the HBR article on that. How do we overcome this gap, right? What can we do as an industry or as project professionals to be able to get the skills and training that we need in change management to ensure we don't have the disruptive change that we're so typically used to seeing? Well, I think a lot of that is really associated with leadership. I mean, change does not have to be disruptive. If you can sell the change to people and and get them to buy into it, they're going to want to contribute. Okay, so uh, I I think it's a it's a leadership uh, 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 issue. uh, What you reminded me of is a quote that I I learned a long time ago, and I have no idea who uh, who actually said it. He uh, the whoever was said that. Every project is a change and every change is a project, okay? And uh, that we need, to, we need to create, especially today, I mean, with, with the way things are changing now since the pandemic started and, and everything is very, very different, you know, and, you know, I don't know what the new norm is. I don't even like that term, but, you know, we're, we're continuing to evolve. And I, I think that the, our executive leaders, need to really make sure that they have what I refer to as a change-ready organization. You know, we've heard the term organizational agility a lot. And, you know, to tell you the truth, it makes a lot of sense. It's not really just a buzzword. It is you got to ask yourself how agile, and I don't mean agile in terms of project management agile. I'm talking about how much agility do we have in our organization that we can shift gears and and move in a better direction or, or change when we really need to. And how willing are our people to accept that and, and minimize the resistance? So we need change-ready organizations. And that means that we need leadership that is going to basically create that environment that, hey, change is welcome. It's not going to stop. There's a quote that I uh, remember because I did a lot of different discussions and uh, programs on change management. But the quote said something like, change is inevitable except from a vending machine. 
<laughs> and you know, just just think about that. <laughs> I mean, it, it makes perfect sense. It's, change is going to happen whether you like it or not. And this pandemic and the, the subsequent changes in our lives, we went virtual. We can't talk to people anymore in person. We're wearing masks. We're, we're washing our hands all the time. You know, we're staying at home. We're hunkering down. We can't go to restaurants. We have to adapt. We have to change. And, and it's going to continue. And, and, you know, as far as that, that new norm, I, don't, I, I think that's a misnomer. We don't have a new norm. We are still norming. And we don't know where that's going to go yet. So, you know, those of you that are, hey, this is the new norm. No, no, it isn't. This is only a phase of what is yet to come. So we are norming. We're just simply going to keep changing and it's going to get different. Technology is changing at even rapid, more rapid paces than ever. And all of it is about, if we, what do we have now? We have uh, artificial intelligence just really taking the whole world by storm. OK, uh, everything is going to be much different. You know, we're, we're moving away from fossil fuel. We're going to have uh, electric everything. Uh, we're going to have, um, you know, uh, natural sources of energy. And we're still evolving on that. Everything is going to change. And I think people need to realize that and start to become more adaptive to change. Yeah, you know, and thinking along those lines, but taking a step outside of the project management world for a second, you're a uh, a New Yorker. I'm a I'm a upstate New Yorker from the Albany area. When we had connected uh, a few months back and started chatting, you had shared with me the the change to New York City with the pandemic and what's happened. And, and I know we have an international audience, but New York City is reflective of all the big metros around the world. What, as a New Yorker, what do you see has happened to that city? And as we're norming, where do you think we we're headed with that? Well, you know, that's a uh, that's an interesting question. And, and you know, I, I don't really have a good answer for that other than um, because of the, the pandemic, um, many people do not commute into the city anymore. OK, they have found that, hey, I, I can work at home and I can even be more productive at home. So I don't have to spend my gas money, tolls, parking, anything like that. I can just stay home. Uh, that in itself, just that one little thing is going to have a major impact on the, the restaurant industry where people would come, you know, go for breakfast and lunch before, you know, going to the office. So that's that's one thing. Uh, another thing is that you've got a lot of property owners who are, have leased space uh, to large corporations and the corporations are now saying, hmm, I don't know if I need all that space anymore. I mean, I got my teams are very virtual and, you know, maybe in the future we'll have some in-person conferences when that becomes safe. But we're not going to need the 55,000 square feet of office space anymore. So um, now the landlords are going to be in trouble because, uh, you know, hey, I got this big building and, and with a lot of this empty space. And we do have a lot of empty space in uh, New York. Uh, another thing is that people have decided that, hey, New York is very crowded. Uh, you know, I'm susceptible to or, or, or exposed to uh, large communities of people. I don't know if I want to walk down the street and be in the crowds. I'm going to move to the suburbs. So people are buying homes in up, up, upper state New, New York and in New Jersey and Connecticut, and they're moving out of the city. Uh, the theaters have been closed for a year. Um, we, we have, uh, unfortunately, and this has nothing to do with project management, we've got a crime situation now. Uh, and, and all of these, to me, are, are signs of some really serious problems for a city like New York and, and other cities that are similar to New York. So we, we, construction is still going on in, in some places. I see it. But personally, I have not been. I used to go to Manhattan all the time. I haven't been to Manhattan since January of last year. And I know lots and lots of other people that only go in there when they absolutely positively have to. And uh, it's a very different kind of a city. And I, I think we're going to see the impact of that uh, in the near future. Yeah, and that's that's a part of this COVID pandemic. We all look at it through our own personal lens, of course. There's major metropolitan areas around the world who are going to be impacted by that. I know my last trip into the city, I'm out here in Phoenix now, so it's not like I get there like I used to, uh, was an IIL IPM day, right? It was to go tape my session and uh, got to meet with a uh, 
Laverne Johnson and Judy Umless and, and that team put together. So I know they're in New York and certainly been impacted by all this uh, as well. You know, that, and it gives me the blues, right? It makes me think I get sad thinking about this because New York City is such an amazing city uh, in all the metros around the world. But project managers, man, we we always deal with, you mentioned 29% success rate on change initiatives, right? We're used to that, right? We're we're not always succeeding. Tell me, you know, in the project management blues, I, I think of a, being in a, a jazz bar, band and uh, hearing them in New Orleans or something like that, right? And there's this old guy over in the corner singing about the project management blues. What's, what's your thoughts on that? Well, I actually, uh, the, the Project Manager Blues, which is is on YouTube, if anybody uh, is interested in, uh, it's a three and a half minute uh, video, audio, little tidbit on, on uh, project management. I, I actually wrote that song uh, many years ago. I was, I, was at a, I was a speaker at a PMI conference, and I'm, I'm, I think it was in Illinois, but I, I can't remember for sure. And um, the uh, we were on a break, a you know, lunch break, and the organizer of the conference, they call these things PDDs, professional development days. Uh, the organizer said, you know, we know you play the guitar. Why don't you like play a song for the people and entertain them during lunch? <laughs> <laughs> and I said, I've had my, I'm like, how can I do that? I mean, what would, what would I do? I don't even have a guitar with me. And, uh, in about two seconds, they handed me this guitar. Hmm. And I said, wow, this is all planned, you know. So they said, yeah, do something. Do something that will, you know, liven everybody up. So I said, well, like, give me 20 minutes or so. Let me think of something. And I went into a, a little huddle room somewhere. And I I said, I, I, I don't know. Let me, let me try something. And I actually jotted this project manager blues song down in about 20 minutes. And it was just a simple, uh, you know, for guitar players, it was a simple E, e progression. And uh, went out there and I, I, they had a little stage and a microphone. And I, I sang this song that I had written uh, like 20 minutes earlier. And, uh, you know, it, it went over really well. And uh, then I, I kind of let it sit for, for a while. And then a, a friend of mine, when I was out doing teaching a class, the building that I was teaching in had a small recording studio. And, and she said, you know, why don't you go in there and, and actually record that song and, you know, we'll, we'll make it a kind of a professional recording. So we we arranged to have that. I was in a little room, uh, microphone, guitar and all that and uh, professional mixer. And what I did was I recorded I, the vocals and I, I did my guitar part. And then they added in a few other musicians, bass guitar, harmonica, drums and so on, lead guitar and put together this uh, this composition. And we pu- published it onto a YouTube s- several years ago. And I, the last time I looked, it had about 43,000 hits. It's a, uh, let's just say it's a humorous look at project management. And then o- only project managers will appreciate <laughs> that particular song. And it has opened uh, for conferences around the world. Uh, several, several organizations have called me and said, would you mind if we play your video as we opened up our conference and a lot of them were in Europe and uh, last year, as a matter of fact, not last year, but in November of 2019, I, I was a, a speaker, a keynote speaker at the uh, PMI Hungary chapter in, in Budapest. And that was the opening. That's, that's how I was introduced with the Project Manager Blues. And uh, there were several organizations that have done that. It was it's a lot of fun. And since then, I've actually I've written... Um, Another song, I haven't recorded this, but it's pretty pretty funny, and I'm gonna I'm gonna get it recorded. It's called the Ballad of the Portfolio Manager. Okay, <laughs> and and I, I, you you as a PMO guy would appreciate, you know, because I talk about PMOs in this in this particular song, and it's to the uh, the style of Johnny Cash. It's like a country, you know, upbeat country uh, yeah. song in the style of Johnny Cash, if you know what that is. So it was a lot of fun to do those things. And I keep uh, dabbling in, in things like that because it's fun. I've even written poems about project management, too. So I have to ask, do you have a guitar handy? <laughs> uh, unfortunately, no. <laughs> <laughs> I'm with you. I, I did a, um, 
an article I posted earlier this year on uh, high voltage project management, and it's uh, a article inspired by the songs of ACDC, where I, I talk about all the different uh, highs and lows and the different verses uh, of in chapters in our careers, and we, we tie that into project management. And, uh, interested to get your take on that. Maybe I'll send you a copy. Tell me what you think. Uh, <laughs> that sounds pretty good. You know, you remind me of something else that I, I do some, some really, uh, I'm going to, I call them creative things, but back some years ago, myself and a colleague at, at Kay Weiss, we, we presented at a, a PMI Congress in New Orleans and our topic was risk management. And my, it was the, it was entitled thinking positive about risk management. And uh, I used music videos uh, in this presentation uh, because I think I wanted people to see that project management was not restricted to construction and IT, mm -hmm. but also to planning a, a rock concert. And I um, opened up the, uh, the session with a video from a band called Poison in which they use pyrotechnics as part of their program. Mm -hmm. And we talked about the risks associated with planning a concert with hundreds of thousands of people and using pyrotechnics in an indoor arena. That was just one example of the amount of planning that has to go into something like that. And then I also used a KISS video that they were doing rock and roll all night because they were big into pyrotechnics too. And oh, yeah. the, the idea was simply, you know, you have to be aware of the, all of the safety factors and the potential for risk and, you know, how people can exit a room and things like that. And all of that was part of it. So you got to use your imagination to uh, to get your point across and do things that people are going to remember. So I'm, I'm glad you brought that up because that was also a lot of fun to do. Yeah. And uh, Poison lead singer Brett Michaels, I believe, is a uh, resident here in Scottsdale, Phoenix area. Uh, oh yeah, we we all got to meet Brett Michaels uh, some years ago for Thanksgiving. He or, he uh, autographed one of my guitars, and uh, I've got pictures of Brett Michaels with all of my daughters. I bet they enjoyed that, right? Oh, it was a lot of fun. It was great. And speaking of music, I'd be remiss if I did not mention uh, Billy Moape, who was a guest on our show uh, in January. Uh, Billy is one of the advisory board members for the PMO leader. And of course he was a PMI TED speaker recently. He is getting close to wrapping up Labuto's champion song. Uh, the song he had mentioned when he was on the show about his son with special needs. Uh, so they're getting ready to produce that and have that uh, released to the world. So everybody keep your eyes and ears open for the work that Billy's doing, uh, as well as I'm going to mess up this name, but Akai. I think is the name of the other performer uh, that's performing on that with Billy. So yes, music and creativity within our project management world is uh, so important. You know, the other part of this is, you know, we talked entertainment, we talked how we can touch into other worlds, but there's a, there's a savviness to this, right? It's, it's being able to know when to be creative. It's knowing when to reach into the business acumen and, and understanding our, the business side of our project. How, how can we be better project managers for the projects we're delivering, right, with business acumen and savviness related to business? Well, um, the, the, what, the thought that comes to mind there is a quote, again, that I learned a long time ago, and I use it all the time. It is uh, that good judgment comes from experience, and experience comes from bad judgment. And if you really think about that, that is uh, super true. So project managers, uh, we, we really expect them to, to use good judgment pretty much every day when they're speaking to customers, when they're speaking to their team and so on. And, and uh, they should be learning from their experience. Now, the, the other thing is, and, and a, a colleague of mine and I, we, we do a program, uh, we've been featured with this program on PMI Seminars World is the four-day project management MBA crash course. And that particular course uh, focuses on a project manager's need to understand business, to understand business acumen, 
uh, understanding that yeah, you, you got to get your project done, you got to plan it, you got to do all those things, but you really need to understand why are you doing this project in the first place? Why was the project justified? What's the business value associated with the project? You know, what's going to be different because of your project? I mean, PMI has been professing the value of project management for years, the business value. It's in the sixth edition of the PMBOK. You know, business value, you know, uh, the emphasis now is on outcome, not on output. So you got to ask yourself questions like, okay, I just completed this project. Now what? What's going to happen? What is different now? How is this going to benefit the customer and how is it going to benefit your organization? We have to start thinking, we should be thinking outcome, not output. I, I completed 20 projects. Well, well, good for you. What, what, what has changed since you did that? How are we better because of it? Many project managers can't answer that question you know, because that was really not part of what their role was. Hey, I just I delivered what I was told to deliver. Well, shouldn't you be more curious as to why it was being done in the first place? So I think that our project managers today, they have the mission. They got to get the project done, but they should be asking questions up front and said, OK, I understand the project. So how is this going to benefit the company? I mean, why, why are we doing this? Uh, what is the intended outcome? Who's going to be affected by it? You know, where are the benefits financially, uh, we'll call tangible benefits and the intangible benefits? That's what project managers, uh, I think, today need to be looking at. You know, I'm doing something. I want to make sure that it's it's valuable, that it's going to create benefit, not just the fact that I completed a project, but it's going to mean something. It's going to do something that is going to be uh, have an impact in an entire organization or a set of customers or stakeholders. That's how I see it. Yeah, and we are starting to see some uh, organizations pop up because of this, right? Oliver Lehman has this uh, the Project Business Foundation. Uh, right, Oliver's got he's going in that direction, and he yeah. and I have had uh, multiple discussions about that. And and it's point on, right? I mean, again, time back to the uh, purpose driven PMO and the PMO squad. I mean, we preach people over process and outcomes over audits. Uh, we have to stop thinking that there's a rigid, consistent way to deliver and start thinking like a salesperson, right? A salesperson goes to close the deal. So the business wins that revenue. They, they win the engagement. Well, we then have to go deliver what they just won. And if we're doing it in a different mindset, the customer doesn't get the end to end experience that they had from the sales experience on the delivery side. So I, I'm with you, Frank. I think it's, uh, it's super important that we have that mindset, that we are business focused and that we are leaders, positive leaders, to be able to engage a team to get the outcomes that we're supposed to be delivering on the project and not just a successful audit that says we were compliant to process, right? It's the outcome that matters. You know, unfortunately, here we are again, end of uh, another fantastic show. These, these uh, always go by so fast, and I could keep talking for hours mm -hmm. with you on this stuff. Uh, but Frank, before we head out, I certainly want to give you a, an opportunity to let the audience know what you have coming up, any ways they can get in touch with you or any items that we didn't get to today that you'd like to touch base with them on. Well, the best way I think would be just to look me up on LinkedIn and uh, send me a uh, an invitation to connect. Uh, one of the things that we're working on myself and uh, uh, Gary Herkins is a, a concept that we had tried uh, or developed several years ago, and we're going to bring it back and kind of modernize it. It's called the Project Management Power Tools. It's going to be a, a series of programs that are, we'll call them bite-sized, two-hour sessions that are focused on practitioner tools and techniques. You know, no theory, uh, just uh, tried and true techniques, tools, templates, and things like that, that the uh, today's project manager uh, can use. Uh, we'll, we'll talk about risk. We'll talk about contracts. We'll, we'll talk about uh, uh, planning, agile. All these different things are going to be in these uh, compact uh, two-hour sessions. That uh, you know, if you're a PMP, we'll get you PDUs in the uh, in each of the three uh, PMI uh, talent triangle areas. Uh, but they're all going to be very focused on practical application. So you know, there's enough theory out there. Uh, we, because of our experience and who we work with, we know that certain things work, certain things that are useful to project managers. So 
anybody's interested in that, the best way would be uh, to go to LinkedIn, look me up, send me uh, an invitation. If you have a question you know, you need uh, immediate attention to, <laughs> you can just send me an email. My email is my my last name, Salatis, S-A-L-A-D-I-S, followed by the letters P-M-P, that's Salatis, P-M-P, at msn.com. And I certainly get back to you with uh, whatever inch of information that you're looking for. Well, thanks so much, Frank, for being on the show today. And uh, after the show, uh, let's stay connected. Obviously, I think uh, that that you had talked about would be perfect to add out to the PMO leader community as well, to have that available out on our site, uh, if that makes sense for you. Um, and certainly thank you to all of our listeners. Uh, be sure to visit projectmanagementofficehours.com. Check out all the great content and list of upcoming shows. We have a great lineup uh, of chats with industry leaders from around the world coming up, including Jennifer Bridges and David Noor, Stuart Easton, uh, from the UK, David Barrett from Canada, Alana Hill, Danielle Torley, Hamutal Weitz, and Daniel Zitter from Israel, Antonio Nito Rodriguez, um, and Karsten Lay. So we've got a powerhouse lineup coming up over the next several months. And a reminder that these shows are being recorded, so you can subscribe to Project Management Office Hours podcast on Apple uh, Podcast iHeartRadio, Spotify, Spreaker, whatever your platform of choice is. And again, thank you to our sponsors, the PMO Squad and the PMO Leader. Reminder to go out and visit thepmoleader.com to register for our launch event, which will be on April 2nd. That's it for now. Office hours are closed. Until next time, I'm PMO Joe, and you've been listening to Project Management Office Hours. Thanks for listening to another episode of Project Management Office Hours with PMO Joe. You're not alone in your project management journey. We're here to help you achieve your goals. Subscribe to Project Management Office Hours on your favorite podcast platform to catch all of our episodes and hear industry leaders share their story and secrets to success.